Turn to Philippians 2, if you would please, with me this morning. Once again, great chapter, isn't it? Going through the book of Philippians, and I'm going to spend this entire day in the second chapter. I'm going to deliberately skip over verses 6 through 8 this morning because that's what I want to concentrate on in our PM Bible study after we have a light lunch. Philippians chapter 2, and the key verse that we're uh, focusing on is verse 5, where it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We want to talk about the mind of Christ, and we'll get to a deeper focus of that in our afternoon when we see how Jesus thinks. So important for us to understand the mind of Christ, the thinking of Jesus. You remember when Jesus informed the 12 disciples that he was going to go up to Jerusalem, he would suffer, he would die there, he'd be crucified. He also said to them that he'd be resurrected the third day. They didn't get it. They pushed back, remember? And Peter even rebuked Jesus for talking like that. And Jesus immediately responded with a rebuke to Peter, and he commanded Peter, and he said, get behind me, Satan, basically because you don't understand the way God thinks. You are thinking only on a human level. That's what Jesus responded with him, uh, uh, to him about. And the thought is simply this. Whenever we simply see things from human wisdom, from the human standpoint, we can become a very real roadblock and stumbling block to God's will and to God's way. And when he called Peter an offense, he meant, you're a stumbling block to me. You're something that would trip me up from doing the will of God. We don't want to put ourselves in that situation and so Paul uses the same word that he rebuked Peter with in this, uh, that Jesus rebuked Peter with in this fifth verse when he says, let this mind, let this thinking be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Literally, be minded, be God-minded, be Christ-minded. Think as God thinks, think as Jesus thinks. The mind of Christ, that's the title of our thoughts in this second chapter of Philippians this morning. Before we go any further, let's pause once again and pray, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, your thinking is so foreign to our natural way of thinking. And yet, Lord, as believers, you said that if we would give ourselves to you and your word that your spirit would uh, put in us the very mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ because we have the living Christ residing in us through his spirit. So, Lord, we know that it's possible to do what verse 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. We have that mind in us. We need to let it out. We need to release, we need to think like that. I pray today that this time together would be glorifying to you and edifying to us. And anyone that doesn't know you personally, it would be a saving time to them. We're just thankful that we have the opportunity and the privilege to meet publicly like this and to open your word together. Lord, speak to our hearts. Glorify your name, Lord Jesus, because that's the reason that we ask it all. Amen. So let's talk about what is the mind of Christ? Well, if you remember from last week, in this first chapter of the book of Philippians, there's some conflict going on. Remember, Paul's a prisoner, and he said that uh, some preach Christ of envy and strife. He says, some preach Christ of contention, and not sincerely. They're, suspo- they're, they're trying to add affliction to my imprisonment, to my bonds. 
in chapter four, he's going to talk about two specific women that uh, were at odds with each other. So there's some there's some conflict that exists in this Philippian church. Some rivalries have developed. There's envy against Paul, and there is strife between uh, individuals, he says. Interesting that that word strife has to do with an activated and an energized rallying, rallying of support for your position. It's politicking, if you will, uh, in the church for your position. And Paul makes it very clear that that is absolutely human carnal thinking when we think that way, when we act that way. Believers had different ways of thinking, different minds. Each one was thinking their own way. And that's why he begins this second chapter by saying this. If there be any consolation, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies or pity and compassion, fulfill ye my joy that ye may be like-minded, having the same love of one accord of one mind. The only solution to this kind of strife that is uh, going on here in the Philippian church is that they needed a total change of heart and a total change of mind and uh, a total change of thinking. Look at what he says that change entails, verses three and four. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, that's pride, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem or value other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then drop down to verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings or arguing. This is the kind of mind that really ought to characterize the way that believers think, that ought to characterize those that have Christ living in them and through them. So what is the mind of Christ? Well, let's look at verse three and begin to unpack this a little bit more. And I think the first thing that I would call to your attention when he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, in humility of mind, let each value or esteem other better than themselves. The first positive aspect or characteristic of a believer that possesses the mind of Christ is that there is a selflessness. That's what verse 3 is really talking about, a selflessness. Self-interest, self-centeredness is mainly a characteristic of people that don't know Jesus, that are lost. It's that kind of attitude is, okay, if I do this, if I go that way, what's in it for me? That's the characteristic of someone that doesn't know Jesus. But so often that is typical of people that claim to know him. There is a distorted orientation that uh, the Lord wants to correct it as people. That we, instead of turning our focus inward on ourselves, we would turn our focus outward so that we would have an interest, not a self-interest, but an interest in other people. That we would be concerned about other people, that uh, it would not be about us. And, you know, that's really what the gospel is. A servant of the Lord, a servant like Jesus, never strives to get something for him or herself. You remember how Jesus put it in that great uh, vine chapter, John 15, abiding in him? If you are depending upon the Lord, if his life is pulsating through your life, he says, this is my commandment unto you that you love one another. Now listen to this, that you love one another as I, Jesus, have loved you. Well, that's the kind of love that is foreign to all of us. That's the highest uh, level of love that is mentioned in the scripture. 
that we would love each other as Jesus loved us. Well, have you ever thought and really meditated upon the level of love that Jesus has for you and for us as his people, believers? That's the kind of love, that's the level of love that we're to have for each other. Is that the kind of love that you have for me and that I have for you or that you have for one another? The kind of love that Jesus, that level of love that Jesus loves you. It's not a natural love. It's not merely a human affection. It is a love that is only born in our heart by God because it's God's love, and it can only be released when we let God work it through us and release it through our lives. It's a selflessness. He goes on in the next verse and says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. It's a self-sacrificing love. It's, I'm willing to die in order for you to be blessed. Selfless. That is how Jesus thinks. That's the mind of Christ. First of all, a selflessness. But look again at verse 3. He says, Let nothing be done through vain glory. In lowliness of mind, that is humbleness. Selflessness and humbleness, of course, go together. We don't do anything out of vain glory, out of conceitedness, or unconcerned with doing things for how we might appear to people. We're not doing what we do so that people will take notice of us. A humbleness, a uh, doing something without vain glory is just doing it because God is working in you and God is working through you. You don't do what you do to elevate your status in the local church. You don't do what you do to get anything in return out of it. Jesus didn't care anything what people thought about him or how they viewed his ministry. And by the way, we're not going to touch on it this morning, but it says that Jesus took the form of a servant in that seventh verse, and the word servant is slave. You realize that if you are a believer, you are a slave of the Lord Jesus? And you know what? Slaves don't care about their reputation. So humbleness is really the way Jesus thinks. It's selflessness. It's humbleness. And then look at verse 14. Drop down there with me. He says, do all things without murmurings. Now, murmurings has to do with uh, a realization that, you know what? If I murmur, I think I deserve something. If I murmur, I, it's because I'm not getting what I think I deserve. And so the mind of Christ is to be filled with a sense of unworthiness that would, of course, prevent murmurings or complainings. Murmuring is an attitude of pitying ourselves. Murmuring is the idea that I deserve better than this. There's only one reason that believers exist, and that is to know and to reveal Jesus, to know him and to reveal him to others. There's a missionary by the name of Helen Rosa Villar. She graduated uh, with a degree in medicine from Cambridge in London. She followed God's will for her life and became a missionary in what was then called the Belgian Congo. Today it's Zaire. She wanted to use her medical uh, abilities to minister to the hundreds of thousands of Africans in that country that had no uh, medical access. Things were going pretty well, and she decided to build a hospital, but she had no one really to guide her. She wrote home to her mother and asked her mother to send, uh, send me a book on building, how to build a hospital, and her mother 
uh, sent her a book on how to make bricks. So she taught the Africans that were with her how to make kiln dried bricks. And as they were taking the first load from the kiln and pulling the spines off of the new bricks, she felt that her fingers were wet and she noticed that uh, her fingers were bleeding. And she thought to herself, here I, I've come from England uh, to be a doctor to these people, not to make bricks. About that moment, a messenger came to her running and announced that she needed to come quickly because surgery was necessary at the moment. And so as she prepared, she was scrubbing her, her hands with a brush and it was so painful, and then had her assistant pour alcohol onto her hands and it almost made her scream with pain. A few weeks later after that incident, one of the African workers said, uh, doctor, when you're in surgery, you're like a god. You, you terrify us. But when you're at the brick kiln and your fingers are bleeding like ours, you're our sister. We love you. And at that moment, she realized that God didn't send her to Africa to be a doctor. He sent her to reveal Jesus. God sent her to be one that would reveal God's love to these people. There's only one thing that every believer deserves, and that is an opportunity to show Jesus to others. And we can't do that if we think that we deserve certain things. And so we have to come to the place in our minds and our hearts where we just say, Lord, I'm unworthy. And maybe you scratch your head over that parable where uh, the, the servant comes in and his master says, uh, feed me. And when he's done all of that, uh, Jesus said, you need to understand that you're just an unworthy servant because all you've done is what you were supposed to do anyway. The mind of Christ focuses on, on our unworthiness. It's selfless. It's humble. And it recognizes unworthiness. Look again at verse 14 as we look a little bit further at the mind of Christ. Do all things not only without murmurings, but also without what? Disputings or arguing. The mind of Christ also involves being agreeable, agreeableness. If you think you can bargain with God, you haven't tapped into the mind of Jesus. You can't compromise God's will for your life by placing conditions upon it. For instance, if God is calling you to a certain locale, you can't say, well, Lord, I'll go over there, but I won't go there. There is no disputing with the mind of Christ. It is, there is an agreeableness, Lord, whatever. <laughs> whatever you want from me, Whenever you want me, I'll do it. Lord, I'm yours. And so the mind of Christ involves selflessness. It involves humbleness. It also involves a, a sense of unworthiness and agreeableness. But why is the mind of Christ, in, if that's what it is, and that's real quick, just a, this, a quick sketch of it, why is it necessary? Why is it such a big deal that we have the mind of Christ? Let this mind be in you. Why? Well, because God's redemption, God's power is only experienced one way, and that is through self-sacrifice, through a forgetting of self, through selflessness, because God cared more about you than he cared for himself. He sent his only begotten son. And this is really at the heart of what being a true witness of the Lord is. Being a true soul winner, wanting to bring people to Christ, or being a, a real intercessor, praying for others. At the heart of that is that 
You have to care more about the people that you're seeking to reach and to bring to the Lord and to develop and build up in the Lord than you are about yourself. That's why the mind of Christ is so important. When your heart is more concerned with others than with yourself, then you're at a place where God could really begin to use you. You remember Moses when he was uh, uh, confronted by the Lord about the idolatry there at the golden calf, the people of Israel, and God wanted to actually destroy the people. And he said, Moses, stand back. I'll destroy them. I'll consume them in a moment, and I'll begin over with you. You can be the head of the Jewish people. And Moses knew that God was putting him to the test. And he stood up for, for God, and he stood up for the people of Israel. And uh, you can read about it, but we won't take the time to do it in Exodus 32. And he came to the point where he actually said, Lord, blot out my name from the book and spare your people. Spare the people of Israel. Take me out instead. That's kind of mirrored also in the heart of the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 9, he was so broken over the fact that Israel had rejected Jesus the Messiah. Here he says, they're my kinsmen according to the flesh. He said, I could wish myself hellbound if it would bring them salvation. I could wish myself accursed for them if it would bring them to faith in Jesus the Messiah. That's the heart of a true intercessor. It's uh, someone who cares more about the people that they're trying to reach and minister to than they do about themselves. That's why the mind of Christ is so important as, as that uh, we and believers, we as believers have it. Because the only hope that will stop the, the, the just judgment of, of God upon our city and upon our country upon anyone or any place is that God's people have the mind of Christ think like Jesus does the success of the Great Commission as it's called depends upon believers having this mind in them that they're not focused on themselves and their needs but they're focused on others and their needs that's what this is all about. And in verses 15 and, and 16 of this chapter, he says, if you do all things without murmurings and disputings, you'll be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. You shroud the light by self-interest. And you, we choke out the life-giving word of God by self-centered living. That's the truth of what he's saying here. And I want to, one more thing I, I want to share with you about the mind of Christ this morning. Not only what it is and why it's necessary, but how do you get it? How do you have this mind of Christ? He says, let this mind be in you. Yeah, how? How does that happen? You mean, can... Can you come to care more about others than you care about yourself? I haven't seen a whole lot of that in Christian circles. Can you come as an individual believer to care more about others than you care about yourself as you sit here this morning? How can I have the mind of Christ? Well, you don't get it by struggling to have it. You don't get it by striving for it. You don't even get it by trying to imitate and emulate Jesus. The only hope that you will ever have the mind of Christ that we are told that this is what we need more than anything else is that our own self-interest, our own self-centered lifestyle or living gets put to death, gets crucified. And that my, uh, that, that, my friends, is impossible apart from God's Holy Spirit. 
Look at what it says in the 12th and 13th verse of this second chapter. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That Those verses are an explanation of the Christ life. And that is how you can have the mind of Christ. It is a work of grace that occurs as you let Christ live his life through your life. No other way. Self-interest. Self-centeredness, that's really the essence of sin. When you peel all the layers back, self-interest and self-centered living is really what sin is about. And that self-interest has more layers than an onion. (laughs) Has to be peeled back over the course of our lifetime. You know... I haven't really stopped to think how many years I've been saved, but I know that I've been serious about knowing the Lord since I was about 18 years of age. And all those years, and he's still peeling the layers of self-interest off my life. Continuous. Till the day I, my mom is 97. I'm still praying for God to peel the layers of self-interest off her life. Because we never get to a place where we've arrived in this life. The mind of Christ. It's him. Samuel Brengel uh, was a, a brilliant student for one thing. He graduated from Boston University. This was way back at the turn of the century. And when he graduated, he was such an outstanding student ministerial student that he was offered a very prestigious pastor in South Bend, Indiana. But he felt that God wanted him to do something different. Instead, he crossed the Atlantic Ocean, went to London, and he joined the humble Salvation Army. He presented himself before the Salvation Army's founder, William Booth. And Booth said to him, we don't want you. You're dangerous. Because All of our officers and staff are converted drunks and prostitutes, and you have too much education, and you won't take orders. Well, Samuel asked for a chance, and so he was sent to the unfinished basement with a dirt floor, half submerged in water, and his job was to clean the mud off of the boots of these converted street bums that were now soldiers in the Salvation Army and to polish their boots. And he said that one day while he was doing that, he heard a, it seemed to, seemed to him like he heard a voice, you're a fool. And you're a sinner too. <laughs> What's wrong with you? You buried your talent in the earth. What are you doing here anyway? You're just throwing all your training away. It sent Samuel into deep depression. And he began to ask God, had he missed his call? Had he failed the Lord? And Jesus spoke to his heart and said, Remember, Sam, I washed their feet. And from then on, he knew that God had called him to do something that he had not thought of before, that God had not called him to invest himself, but rather to spend himself for others. To live a life to enrich other people spiritually. To make yourself totally available to other people. Are you a lifesaver or a life loser? You know, Jesus said, if you try to hoard and hold on to this physical life of yours, you're a loser. You're the biggest loser. If you try to save your life, are you a lifesaver in the negative sense that you're trying to save your life, you're trying to spare your life, you're trying to live in comfort and and convenience as much as possible? You'll only go so far in your life with the Lord because 
You don't want to give up certain creature comforts or certain possessions. Are you a lifesaver or a life and thus a life loser? Because if you live with that mindset, you lose your life as far as the Lord is concerned. God doesn't want you merely to invest your life. He wants you to spend your life for him. Spend it all, the whole wad. Spend your life for the Lord in whatever way he sees fit, even if no one else knows about it. Even if it turns out to be what the world would call the biggest failure ever. If you're in the will of God, you can spend your life and you know that you won't lose it. You'll save it. There's another pastor. His name was Joseph Son. He was a Romanian pastor during the days of the communist regime there. And uh, he was arrested for speaking out against the government. They confiscated his whole library as a pastor. They left him a couple of books. One book he put on his nightstand to remind him. And then the other book he put on his bookshelf. And uh, Joseph was taken in for interrogation seven hours a day, five days a week. And one day after an especially grueling period of interrogation, he went home, he locked the door of his study, he fell on the floor just sobbing, and he said, Lord, I can't take it anymore. And he thought he heard a voice saying, Joseph, get up and read the book on the shelf. Well, that wasn't hard to figure out. There's only one book left. He grabbed that book, and uh, he looked at it, and it was a devotional book called How to Live the Abundant Life, or How to Live Above Your Circumstances. The, the title of the book was Living Abundantly, and that was the, the devotional reading for the day, How to Live Above Your Circumstances. And it was a devotional thought about Jesus embracing fully the cross instead of resisting it. And Joseph said to the Lord, Lord, you mean you want me to you want me excuse me, you want me to embrace my interrogators? If that's so, Lord, you're gonna to have to change this heart of mine because I'm not ready to do that. And so he went into that next interrogation really with a changed heart. <coughs> He said when he walked in the room, it was like the whole atmosphere had changed. And the interrogator, the head interrogator, he realized he lost control of the situation because Joseph wasn't afraid of him anymore. <clears throat> and so he just said, you're stupid. You've left us no alternative but to kill you. We're just going to have to kill you. And Joseph said something like this. Well, I understand that's your ultimate weapon. But I want you to know that I have an ultimate weapon, too. And the interrogator said, well, what's that? He said, death, to die, because when I die, I'm going to be better off, and your troubles are just going to be beginning. He said, when I remember Paul said to be with Christ is far better. And then he said, and every recorded sermon of mine will be sprinkled with my blood, giving it a greater effect than it ever had before. Here is a man that realized finally that his life wasn't dear to himself. He didn't count his life dear to himself, just like the Apostle Paul. You can't count your life dear to yourself if you have the mind of Christ. That's really what it takes. Our lives are so dear to us. We won't even get on a train if our lives might, in any sense, be affected by it. We won't come to church if we have COVID because we're afraid or if that we might get it from someone else. Our lives are so dear unto us, we've forgotten what we're here for. We think we're here to protect our lives, but actually the opposite is true. If we live to protect our lives, we're the losers. If we are personally lifesavers, we're the losers. Our lives are to be lived for God and not for ourselves. Our lives are not to be precious to ourselves. We are so caught up in what we want, what we need, 
we have forgotten the whole purpose why we exist. The mind of Christ needs to be regained, perhaps actually understood for the first time. It's a mind of selflessness that is the result of humbleness, and it includes an unworthiness. I'm not worthy, O oh Lord. And thus an agreeableness, Lord, whatever you want, it's okay with me. I'm here for you, not for me. This is what the mind of Christ is. This is what Paul says you need to have if you're a believer. This is the mind that this is the thinking that we need. We need our thinking totally reprogrammed, don't we? Totally reprogrammed. Why we're here. And it's not about us. 